What if I told you that a plane with just one aisle is about to transform global aviation as we know it? On June 15, 2022, the Airbus A321XLR quietly took off for its first test flight. No fanfare, no spectacle, just four and a half hours cruising over European skies. While it might have looked like just another A321 to casual observers, this moment marked a revolution in commercial aviation. This isn't just another incremental improvement, it's a paradigm shift. A skinny jet that can fly basically as far as its wide-bodied siblings, but at a fraction of the operating cost. But why is this particular aircraft causing such a stir among industry insiders? And what makes it the most strategically significant commercial aircraft of the decade? Let's rewind to understand how we got here. When jetliners first conquered the skies, crossing oceans didn't actually require massive aircraft. The Boeing 707 and DC-8, both single-aisle designs, routinely crossed the Atlantic with ease. These slender jets, they had surprising range capability, despite their modest proportions. Then came aviation's golden era. The 1970s ushered in the age of the wide-body giants, the Boeing 747, DC-10, and Lockheed L-1011 TriStar. Two aisles, spacious cabins, and crucially, vast cargo holds that could swallow freight by the ton. Airbus entered this market with its first commercial jet, the A300 widebody, in 1974. But it was their strategic pivot in 1984 that would change everything. That year, Airbus launched the A320 program, a narrow-body challenger to Boeing's ubiquitous 737. What seemed like just another single aisle aircraft actually laid the groundwork for what would become the most successful aircraft family in history. Have you ever wondered why airlines are so obsessed with fuel efficiency? Consider this. Fuel, it typically accounts for 30% of an airline's operating costs. Even a 1% improvement in efficiency can translate to millions in savings annually. Fast forward to 2010, as oil prices climbed and environmental concerns mounted, Airbus announced the A320neo family. Neo standing for new engine option. These weren't just marginally better engines. The new Pratt & Whitney PW1000G and CFM Leap 1A power plants delivered a 15-20% to reduction in fuel consumption, significantly lower emissions, and the noise footprint reduced by 50%. The economics were compelling. Each Neo-equipped aircraft saved operators significant fuel costs per year compared to previous models. The A319, A320, and A321 all received this upgrade. Only the smallest family member, the A318, was left behind. Its limited sales couldn't justify the investment. Then came a critical development. In 2018, Airbus introduced the A321LR, long range. This modified A321neo incorporated three additional center tanks, ACTs, beneath the passenger deck extending its range to an impressive 4,000 nautical miles. What made this possible wasn't just the extra fuel capacity. The A321LR also received ETOPS 180 certification, allowing it to fly routes up to three hours from the nearest diversion airport, even with one engine inoperative. This opened up transatlantic routes that were previously the exclusive domain of widebody aircraft. But even as the LR was entering service, airlines were already asking for more. What exactly happens when an aircraft manufacturer pushes a single-aisle jet to its absolute limits? You get the A321XLR, extra long range. Unveiled at the 2019 Paris Air Show, the XLR promised something unprecedented, a range of 4,700 nautical miles in a single-aisle package. Think Perth to the Maldives, London to Delhi, Singapore to Tokyo. The engineering breakthrough that made this possible? The rear center tank, RCT. Unlike the removable ACTs used in the LR variant, the XLR features a permanent, integrated fuel tank mounted just behind the wing box. This single tank replaces four standard ACTs while only adding the weight equivalent of one and occupying the space of just two. The result is nothing short of revolutionary. More range, more payload capacity, and more cargo space. But here's a question worth considering. 
If single aisle jets can now fly these destinations, what happens to the traditional role of wide body aircraft? If you're thinking this aircraft only appeals to low cost carriers looking to dabble in long haul routes, think again. The A321XLR has garnered over 550 orders from airlines all across every business model. Legacy carriers, low cost carriers, and everything in between, they all see value in this aircraft type. Why? Because it gives them unprecedented flexibility. Imagine you're running Aer Lingus. Your Dublin to New York route, it sees some high demand during summer, but it thins out considerably in the winter. With the A321XLR in your fleet, you can deploy your A330s during peak season and switch to the more efficient XLR during shoulder seasons, maintaining the route year-round without bleeding money in the off-season. Then there's JetBlue's approach. Their A321LRs are configured with just 138 seats, fewer than many regional jets to accommodate mint business class suites. This creates a premium experience that commands higher fares while keeping operating costs well below those of a wide body. This versatility, it's precisely why the industry has embraced the XLR with such enthusiasm. But every aircraft design, it involves trade-offs, and the A321LR revealed an important one. These additional fuel tanks, well, they took up valuable cargo space. For airlines, this creates a pretty difficult equation carry more fuel for longer range or preserve cargo capacity for revenue-generating freight and baggage. Many carriers have addressed this by reducing seat count and focusing on premium cabins. Fewer passengers, well, that means fewer bags, allowing space for both fuel and cargo. But it wasn't an ideal solution. This challenge, it became particularly acute when analyzing payload range curves, a critical performance metric that aviation insiders scrutinized closely. With the A321LR, airlines found themselves making constant calculations. How many passengers could they carry? How much cargo? How much fuel? Each variable, it directly affected the others in ways that limited operational flexibility. For routes like New York to Lisbon, the math could work. But pushed beyond that, say to deeper European destinations, and the constraints became more severe add unexpected headwinds, and suddenly flight planners were juggling whether to reduce passenger count, offload cargo, or add a fuel stop. And then, something happened that made cargo space more valuable. After 2020, air freight rates skyrocketed. Belly cargo, shipments carried in passenger aircraft, suddenly it became a crucial revenue stream. Some wide-body flights remained profitable even with half-empty passenger cabins, simply because of what they carried below. During this period, cargo yields occasionally exceeded $5 per kilogram on certain routes, more than triple pre-pandemic levels. Airlines that had previously viewed cargo as a supplementary revenue stream, well, they suddenly found it accounting for nearly 40% of total income on some routes. This highlighted a potential weakness in the long-range narrow-body strategy. Could these airlines compete if they sacrificed too much cargo capacity for fuel? The industry needed a better solution than the crude trade-off between range and revenue-generating space. This is precisely where the XLR's integrated rear center tank changes the game. By building the additional fuel capacity directly into the airframe, rather than placing removable tanks in the cargo hold, Airbus engineers, well, they preserved valuable cargo space while extending range. Airlines no longer have to choose between fuel and freight, they can optimize for both. Think of it this way, the XLR essentially gives carriers a modern-day Boeing 757, an aircraft beloved for its exceptional range, airport flexibility, and efficiency, but with 21st century technology and 25% better fuel economy. The 757, despite ending production in 2004, remained in service precisely because, well, nothing else could fill its unique niche until now. But innovation, it rarely comes without challenges. The European Union Aviation Safety Agency EASA, they raised concerns about the XLR's new fuel tank design, specifically regarding protection in a gear-up landing scenario. It wasn't a minor issue. The XLR's rear center tank, it sits in what aviation safety experts call the crush zone, the area most likely to absorb impact energy during a belly landing. The question was simple, but it was also crucial. Could this new tank configuration maintain its integrity during a survivable crash event? 
EASA certification specialists required something beyond theoretical calculations. They wanted empirical evidence that, in a worst-case scenario, a high-energy impact with no landing gear deployed, passengers wouldn't face additional risks from the new fuel system. Airbus, well, they've had to redesign elements of the lower fuselage fairings, potentially shifting from lightweight composite materials to more robust alternatives that can withstand a belly landing while protecting the RCT. These fairings, they serve as the first line of defense. In a belly landing, they need to absorb initial impact energy, deform predictability, and prevent any penetration of the tank structure. It's a complex engineering problem involving material science, structural dynamics, and crash energy management. The first test aircraft flew with the original fairing design, but production models will require the updated configuration, contributing to program delays. This reflects a fundamental tension in aircraft development. On the one side, the push for innovation. On the other, the uncompromising requirements of safety certification. Every novel system, it must prove itself not just in normal operation, but also in worst-case scenarios that hopefully, dare we say, never will occur. Nevertheless, Airbus maintains that these changes they won't impact the aircraft's promised performance. The only penalty is time to market. Some industry analysts they estimate that these certification challenges added approximately 9 to 12 months to the program timeline. Not insignificant but relatively modest compared to the multi-year delays that have plagued other new aircraft programs. Have you noticed how rare truly revolutionary aircraft have become in the commercial sector? Incremental improvements are the norm, making the XLR's departure from convention all the more significant. When Boeing and Airbus do introduce new models, they typically represent evolutionary rather than revolutionary advancement, making the XLR's game-changing capabilities all the more remarkable. Iberia? Well, they didn't waste any time putting the XLR to work. By November 2024, the Spanish flag carrier was operating it between Madrid and key US destinations like Boston and Washington DC. The results? Impressively quiet cabins, strong operational performance, and fuel consumption that made their finance department smile. These are classic long and thin routes, significant distance, but moderate demand precisely the scenario where the XLR shines. More recently, Aer Lingus has also begun A321 XLR operations, including flying from Dublin to Minneapolis. JetBlue, they plan to deploy the aircraft on transatlantic routes from the East Coast to city pairs in Europe that wouldn't support larger aircraft. With 13 aircraft on order, we could see some pretty cool routes. LATAM, they're also exploring new connections between northern Brazil and southern Europe that bypass the traditional hubs. Air Canada, they see potential in direct service from Toronto to smaller European cities such as Funchal, Malaga and Nantes without resorting to wide-body overkill. And this, it's just the beginning. American Airlines has marked its calendar. Later this year, its first batch of XLRs will enter service initially replacing the aging A321T fleet on premium transcontinental routes before expanding to international destinations. These aircraft they'll feature next-generation business class suites, a premium offering from a single-aisle jet. Then there's Indigo, India's low-cost powerhouse, with its first XLR delivery expected mid-year. The carrier is targeting previously unserved routes throughout Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and Eastern Europe, markets where full-service carriers have traditionally maintained monopolies. Qantas, Wizz Air, Lufthansa, Jetstar, and Air Lingus are all lining up with strategic plans for their XLR fleets. Despite some supply chain-related delays, the industry-wide adoption continues to accelerate. What would you do if you could fly non-stop between cities that never had direct connections before? Because that's exactly what the XLR enables. Consider the possibilities for just a moment. Direct flights from Kansas City to Frankfurt, Chennai to Nairobi, Perth to the Maldives, routes that were previously uneconomical or required a wide-body aircraft suddenly become viable. The XLR becomes a strategic scalpel in an airline's fleet planning toolkit. Want to test demand on an unproven route without the financial risk of a twin-aisle deployment? The XLR it provides that capability. Man, let's not overlook the environmental angle. 
Compared to previous generation aircraft serving similar routes, the XLR reduces fuel burn by approximately 30% per seat, a significant improvement in an industry under increasing pressure to address its carbon footprint. United Airlines is already evaluating new connections between the US and Brazil using the XLR. Saudi, they also see potential in European destinations that may not support widebody service. The A321XLR's journey is just beginning. Airlines are paying close attention to its performance. Airbus is undoubtedly considering future enhancements, cabin improvements, aerodynamic refinements, or even a stretched variant. Industry analysts speculate about potential derivatives. Some suggest an A322 with increased capacity. Others envision a Neo Plus with uprated engines and further range extensions. The most intriguing concept circulating among aerospace engineers is what some have dubbed the A321XXL, a hypothetical stretch that would add approximately three to four rows of seating while preserving the XLR's impressive range capabilities. Such an aircraft, it would further encroach on territory traditionally dominated by small wide bodies like the Boeing 7878. There's even industry chatter about applying the XLR's innovations to a next-generation A320 replacement. We made an entire video about what's next after the Airbus A320, so be sure to check that out on our channel. Meanwhile, Boeing's response remains unclear. Their existing 737 MAX family, it lacks the fuselage diameter to accommodate auxiliary fuel tanks of the necessary size. The 737 MAX 10, while offering competitive seat counts, it falls significantly short on range, and Boeing's NMA, new mid-market airplane concept, initially envisioned as a 757-767 replacement, remains in development limbo. This leaves Airbus with a potential 5-7 to seven year monopoly in this specific market segment. In aerospace terms, that's an eternity. Enough time to secure significant market share and establish the XLR as the industry standard. But the fundamental value proposition, it remains clear. Transoceanic range in a single aisle platform that offers operational economics no wide body can match. One aisle, two engines, nearly 4,700 nautical miles of range, and a complete rethinking of what's possible in commercial aviation. For passengers, the implications, they're mixed. The XLR enables new non-stop routes between previously unconnected city pairs, a clear benefit but the narrower fuselage means more restrictive cabin environments for long-haul flights. Airlines will need to carefully balance seat density with passenger comfort, particularly in economy class, where the 3-3 configuration means windows and middle seat passengers must disturb their neighbors for aisle access during long flights. Premium cabins present different challenges. While airlines like JetBlue, ITA Airways, and Aer Lingus They've demonstrated that good business class products are possible in narrow-body aircraft. The limited cabin width constrains design options. Will passengers paying $3,000 for a business class ticket accept a more confined experience than what's available on wide-body aircraft? Well, the market, that's what will ultimately decide. The A321XLR isn't just another aircraft, it's the beginning of a new era in how we connect our world. Will single-aisle jets, like the XLR, ultimately replace wide bodies on many long-haul routes? Is this the beginning of the end for the hub-and-spoke airline model? Hub-and-spoke models? Well, they've dominated international aviation for decades, concentrating passengers at major airports before redistributing them to final destinations. The economics of the XLR? It could accelerate the growth of direct services between secondary cities, fundamentally altering global connectivity patterns. Consider the implications for airports as well. Many regional facilities, they lack infrastructure for wide-body operations, but they could potentially accommodate A321XLR services, opening new international gateways without massive infrastructure investment. The future? It's taking shape before our eyes, and it looks remarkably different from what we predicted even a decade ago. The pandemic accelerated many aviation trends, but the rise of the long-range narrow body was already underway. What we're witnessing isn't a temporary adjustment, but a fundamental restructuring of how aviation connects the world. If you enjoyed this deep dive into the aviation industry's most destructive new aircraft, hit that subscribe button and let me know in the comments which aviation topic you'd like me to explore next.